Welcome to Southwark Cathedral on this most holy day. We begin our meditations by standing to sing hymn number 86, My Song is Love Unknown. Do you please be seated? This is the day when we recall the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And to help us do this, to reflect on the suffering and death of Jesus, we naturally first turn to the Gospels for their depictions of these horrific events. And what we discover there is that from the very beginning, the story of the Passion of Christ was already being shaped by interpretation, by an artistry and imagination. The suffering of the Messiah and his death on an instrument of humiliating torture cried out for explanation, as in many ways it didn't make easy sense. The Messiah was to bring victory and liberation not be bound up by an occupying power and done away with as some second-rate criminal. We find, for instance, the apostle Paul grappling with the meaning of this death. And along with the evangelists, together in the New Testament, they explore that mystery that has come to be known as atonement, that is, an 
at one a belief that in some way through this death, God and his world were never closer. Paul and the evangelists work hard in their exploration, using images and metaphors drawn from the things they knew well, for example, the temple or the battlefield, the slave market, the law court, family life, all these images they use to try and piece together models of how this atonement worked through what appeared to be a shameful and an embarrassing end to a life. But no theory of atonement was ever declared to be definitive by the church. In the creeds, we simply hear that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Influential thinkers through the centuries have offered theories of the atonement that they have made sound pretty definitive, but in fact their theories are part of a much larger collection of ideas that have come and sometimes gone in the life of the church that still refuses to be definitive in interpretation. Instead, the hearers of the story of Christ's passion and death are encouraged to find meaning in their own response, like listening to a piece of music, and to place this story near to their own stories of suffering in life to see what connects or resonates in their own lives of faith. And sometimes meaning doesn't just come on demand. We just sit and pray. Now, because of this openness to interpretation, to the search for meaning in the death of Jesus, the desire, if you like, to see in the dark, it shouldn't surprise us to learn that the poets of the world have been drawn through the centuries to use their art and imagination to help excavate understanding. When the story of the passion is told in English language poetry, we can often identify versions of the great models of atonement that have been developed here and there, but we can also find these images combined in new, provocative ways, producing open spaces rather than closed off doctrines. So in this time together, in which Christ was nailed to the cross, we here shall look at just a few of the poets who have opened up channels into the meaning of this death and how God comes close and reveals his nature to us as Christ breathes his last. We shall look at how some early Anglo-Saxons understood this, how some in the medieval period did, and also then in the 20th century looked at the cross and saw in the dark. And as we do this, so also our hymns, which are of course poems, will reflect their different centuries. If you like, we will be praying with our spiritual ancestors. We have already heard a poem. We just sang Samuel Crossman's My Song is Love Unknown. Crossman, a former Dean of Bristol, was a 17th century contemporary of John Milton, and for a long while shared Milton's Puritan theology. Milton himself had once tried to write a poem on the Passion, but later admitted that the subject was above the years he had when he wrote it. Milton was never to return to the theme, actually. In Paradise Lost, the cross, is given just three lines. But Crossman did approach the topic, and although some of the power of the verse actually comes from phrases he nicked from George Herbert, love unknown, and never was love, dear king, never was grief like thine, Crossman relates the suffering of Christ to himself. It is my song my Saviour, oh, who am I that 
may I say, my friend indeed, so much that here might I stay and sing. The cross is bound up with personal meaning. Indeed, Crossman's life without this friend would have all his days spent very differently, and you discern much poorer. This is the first theme of the poems we will encounter in this devotion. The truth at the cross of Christ, though difficult to understand or summarize, is of profound life-giving importance to each Christian soul trying to glimpse something here into the nature of God. Not just an example, but a sample of God's true nature and of how God relates to us, how God loves us just as we are, how God loves us so much he doesn't want us to stay like that. So we discover in the poets that the suffering of Jesus and his death are caught up with our meaning, but also somehow with God's too, with God's life and being, with God's love and hiddenness and communication. The poets, of course, will not spell out exactly or conclusively how these things might be understood or embraced. Instead, we are given a gift of a rich and complex web of metaphors and symbols, if you like, a collage pointing towards an imperfectly understood reality, just like religious language itself. In the life of faith, what we long for most finally always eludes us because desire, not a rival, is the heartbeat of faith. Only hints and guesses today so that through a poetic spirituality which seeks to deepen the mystery of God, not resolve it, we may grow into the spaces that God's silence offers as Jesus takes his last breaths. God is in the world as poetry is in the poem, and never more than in that baffling, moving, tragic, painful, resonant place we call Calvary. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed them, him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus. We stand to sing the hymn, Sing My Tongue, The Glorious Battle.
from the dream of the rude. Then that most noble tree spoke. It was long since, I yet remember it, that I was hewn at Holt's end, moved from my stem. Strong fiends seized me there, worked me for spectacle. Cursed ones lifted me on shoulders, men bore me there, then fixed me on hill. Fiends enough fastened me. Then saw I mankind's Lord come with great courage when he would mount on me. Then dared I not against the Lord's word bend or break when I saw earth's fields shake. All fiends I could have felled, but I stood fast. The young hero stripped himself. He, God Almighty, strong and stout-minded. He mounted high gallows, bold before many, when he would loose mankind. I shook when that man clasped me. I dared still not bow to earth, fall to earth's fields, but had to stand fast. Rude was I reared. I lifted a mighty king, Lord of the heavens, dared not to bend. With dark nails they drove me through. On me those sores are seen, open malice wounds. I dared to not scathe anyone. They mocked us both, we two together. All wet with blood I was, poured out from that man's side after ghost he gave up. Much have I borne on that hill of fierce fate. I saw the God of hosts harshly stretched out. Darknesses had wound round with clouds the corpse of the wielder, bright radiance. A shadow went forth, dark under heaven. All creation wet, king's fall lamented, Christ was on rude. I spoke in my introduction of that creative opening up of space that poetry can give to us resistant to the idea that truth is simply information. The poem I want to look at here is a good example of this. The poem you just heard probably comes from the early 8th century, one of the very earliest Christian poems in English. And a long extract from it can still be seen in runic form carved on a cross in Ruthel in Dumfrieshire. It's been given the title, The Dream of the Rude. Rude was originally the only Old English word for the instrument of Christ's death. The words cross and crucifix came later. And the early English poetic enigmatic mind was captured by this rude of Christ. In this poem, of which we heard only a part of its 156 lines and whose author remains unknown, the narrator describes a strange dream of a wonderful tree covered with gems, and he is aware of how wretched he is in comparison. But then he sees that amidst all the beautiful stones, this tree is stained with blood. The tree then speaks and tells us that it was cut down to bear a criminal, but a young warrior who is lord of mankind climbed him. This rude is not only vocal, but has emotions. And gradually a mysterious identity forms between the wood and the warrior the rude and the ruler. The dark nails that pierce the warrior pierce the tree too. Darkness overwhelms them both. Though the emotions depicted are complex, the narrative itself is swift and spare and the climax is quickly reached. All creation wept, kings fall lamented. 
Christ was on rood. The tree speaks not only for the cosmos, but as part of it, and then charges the narrator to share all that he's seen with others. The vision ends, and the man is left with his thoughts, finding himself filled with some hope. The poet doesn't explore the events that lead up to the crucifixion, and this is usual for Christian art and literature of this period. Instead, we're focused on the cross itself. Ever since the Emperor Constantine, who had said that he would conquer in the sign of the cross, the potency of the cross as a force against evil and the foe was explored in patterns of poetry. The feast of the exaltation of the cross had been instituted in the church in the seventh century. And two hymns that had been written in honor of a large relic of the true cross were sung for that feast. And you sang one of them just now. And the author of The Dream of the Rood may have sung that same hymn as you did. For there are some signs of liturgical influence on that poem. Written by the bishop and poet Fortunatus, this Latin hymn, like many of the time, sing of Christ's battle won and of warfare ended. Likewise, though not as triumphalistic, the image of Christ in the poem of the Rood is that of an Anglo-Saxon hero warrior. That's who Christ is in this poem. Indeed, the poet actually uses a native phrase for Christ that is once applied to that other hero, Beowulf. However, the poem builds up in crescendo to the true identity of this hero who is coming to the tree. The rood tells us how this young warrior actively strips himself for the fight, hastens with resolute courage to climb the tree, and then rests limb-weary after the exhaustion of single combat as Lord of Victories, watched over by his faithful followers. By contrast, the cross remembers how it was pierced with dark nails, drenched with blood, endured many grievous wrongs from wicked men, was wounded with weapon points, stood weeping and was finally leveled to the ground. All the sympathy and pathos of the reader are directed towards the cross. The comparison between the cross and the crucified one corresponds to the relation between the human nature of Christ, the rude, and the divine son of God, the warrior. But suffering in this poem is very much caught up with victory. Victory over what or whom isn't spelt out exactly, as it is in some Latin poems, such as the one we just sang. What is striking about this poem is that it offers no explanation or theory as to how the victory and the suffering converge. The impression given is that the victory interprets the suffering, but we can't quite see how. All we do know from the poem is that the passion is not understood as tragedy, but as a fulfillment of divine purpose. Here we have a Lord who does not courageously know what has to be done alone. In some early Christian art, this is made very evident in some depictions by Christ climbing up a ladder onto the cross, freely taking upon himself the cost of a savior. Christ being shown rather like a fireman going up the steps to the window through which he will end his life. As another early poem of this period says, man stole the fruit, but I must climb the tree. This ascending is purposeful 
accepting the divine will. Here, Christ eagerly leaps onto the cross to do battle with death. The cross is a sort of loyal retainer, paradoxically forced to participate in his Lord's execution. But here, Jesus is no helpless victim. He is a warrior hero who, to use contemporary comparisons, is enlisted by God for a cosmic regime change, a man giving his life as an enlisted peacekeeper. We're reminded of the combat that goes into shaping our soul for good or evil. Goodness here is being fought for. It doesn't just happen. And the good of our humanity is likewise fought for. This non-specific nature of Christ's triumph draws readers into making connections for themselves, as does the narrator himself, who ends by reflecting on his own life, in which he feels many yearnings within himself. Above all others, this poem betrays the spirit of tender yet passionate veneration, of awe and adoration for the wondrous cross on which we often sing, the Prince of Glory died. See how that theme was passed on, the Prince of Glory. And of course, we only need to look around a cathedral or a church to see how the cross in the spirit of our poet is made a fruitful tree with its branches reaching out and flowering. This is the cross that Christ, those early poets say, could not ever have avoided or fled from. He goes to it resolute, with purpose. He doesn't think twice for you. He loves you, wants to protect you, fight for you and die for you. That is how much we are caught up in the being and love of God. And that Anglo-Saxon poet of the dream of the rude is in awe of that tree who was also cut down and raised up, but who never forgot that day when he saw the God of hosts stretched out. Carrying the cross by himself, Jesus went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. We stand to sing at the cross her station keeping.
from the commonplace book of John Grimstone. Lover me brouter and lover me router, man to be thy fairer. Lover me fedder and lover me ledder, and lover me let it hearer. Lover me slough and lover me draw, and lover me laid on bearer. Lover is me pez full love each s man to buy and dearer. Ne dread thee not, I have thee sought, both in day and night, to haven thee, well is me. I have a thee won and in fight. Love brought me, and love wrought me, to be man your friend. Love fed me, and love led me, and love kept me here. Love slew me, and love drew me, and love laid me out on the bier. Love is my peace, and for love I chose to redeem man at such cost. Don't be afraid, for I have looked for you both day and night, in order to be your haven. And I am well, I have won you in the fight. We have just looked at how the Anglo-Saxon poetic tradition explored the relationship between Christ's suffering and his victory, that hero leader who ascends the rood to save his people by battling with evil and death, protecting his own, destroying the destructive. In some later medieval poetry, we can find some overlap of thought, where Christ is the courtly lover knight who tries to woo the lady human soul and win her love through a jousting conflict with her enemies. In one lyric, the cross is indeed like a horse which Christ in the coat armor of human nature rides to this purpose. My palfrey is of tree, he says. But on the whole, in the period from the 12th century onwards, a shift occurs, taking us away from such victorious and heroic imagery. Instead of Christ the glorious warrior, we now begin to find an intense meditation beginning on the suffering humanity of Jesus. The medieval period was characterized by a revolution of feeling, a new interest in the human figure of Jesus, and by an imaginative reflecting on his human life and pain. Spiritual writers such as Richard Roll and Julian of Norwich focus on the bleeding wounds of Jesus as objects for devotion. But they are not now wounds that are incidental to a battle, but they are an expression of divine love and pity, which in turn awakens pity and love in the observer. The regal crown of Christ victorious is now replaced in this period by a crown of thorns. This love of the Saviour becomes fragile. People acquainted with wars and with the plague see now a suffering and death that they well understand. Christ incarnates their own pain and reveals the nature of God as one who comes alongside us in our grief. In a leprosy hospital chapel in France, we find a crucifix with Jesus 
looking like a leper. Christ the King is now the man of sorrows, his sorrows and theirs. We even start in this period to find carved figures of the wounded Christ detached from the cross so one was able to focus on his pierced heart and on his five wounds, described in one poem as the wound words that lie on the book of Christ's body that we open up into a view of God. Very different from the Anglo-Saxon focus on the cross, we now find these depictions of Christ separated off the cross so that we can see his body. In art, not least in rude screens that were now being built, Christ's eyes now close in death. His skin turns white. The blood becomes visible. And the Virgin Mary and St. John appear for the first time at the foot of the cross. That is, the personal relations of family and friends are brought near to this suffering, making this suffering his and theirs, identifiable with. And so it is in this period that poetry, music, and devotion begin to address the pain of Christ's mother and direct compassion towards her. Emotionally, the poets are so involved with the scene of the crucifixion that they are impelled even to address Mary herself and to compare her pain, her pierced soul, to that of her son. We find an intensification of feeling taking place at a time when Christian drama, as distinct from liturgical drama, is also being born. This feeling begins to make the crucifixion seem a contemporary event, a continuously present drama in which we are involved. And it is pity, pity, that is the prime emotion. Marjorie Kemp, in her 15th century writing, at one point tells Our Lady to cease sorrowing for her son because her son is out of pain now and Marjorie takes Our Lady home where she made a good caudal of broth to comfort her. This is devout creativity, praying as though one was bodily present with Jesus' relatives. A good example of these intensities is Stabat Mater Dolorosa, a hymn version of which we just sang. This is a hymn composed sometime in the 12th or 13th centuries by an unknown author. It was introduced into the liturgy in the later Middle Ages and many English versions were written that are notable for this tenderness of feeling that shapes the poetry of the passion at this time. The simple form of the poem each stanza of three lines, having the first two lines rhyming and the third line rhyming with the third line of the next stanza, gives this impression of a calm, mournful progression that is somber and tender. The name Mary is never mentioned. She becomes the archetypal mother and this a poem about human suffering and mothers losing their children, of which many 
were doing at that time as much as about the Virgin Mary. Is there one who would not weep at this sight? The hymn asks. Tears here are a grace, not a disgrace. The poem we heard read, first in Middle English and then in a contemporary translation, from the commonplace book of John Grimston from 1372, shows how love, more than courage, is now being placed at the heart of atonement, at the heart of God. Christ is the victim of his love, more than its champion. In a similar vein, it is at this time that Christ also begins to be addressed himself as mother by such as Julian of Norwich, speaking of the homeliness of God's love, of its nurture and protection. It's a very welcome introduction of the feminine into the nature of divine love. This love should also, of course, be at the heart of us. And this belief also begins to come through the writings of the time. For the intensification of feeling that sees Christ as vulnerable as we are, and which also at the same time alerts us to that human suffering in the world, leads to a belief that devotion should be translated into action. As one poet of the time has Christ say, to carry my cross is to carry my words in your heart. We find a confidence that the revelation of the love of God in the cross will actually create love in hard and sinful hearts. The divine revelation entailing human re-evaluation. C.S. Lewis later pursued this idea with his Aslan Christ, defrosting human beings back into the divine image. The 14th century Walter Hilton writes, don't spend all your time meditating on the passion to the neglect of your fellow Christian. Wash Christ's feet by attending to your subjects and your tenants. If devotion comes not with mind of the passion, strive not to press too much thereafter. The suffering of Christ was always identified in the least of the brethren. If in the Middle Ages the sufferings of humanity came to be concentrated in those of one man, his suffering in turn came to give meaning to those of the world. And the commandment of love was clear and found in the instructions, for instance, of a monastic order from the period telling the brothers and the abbot to kiss poor men with mouth and eyes, that is to touch and see them eye to eye and to see Christ in them and not look away. At the end of the 15th century, carols appeared in a court songbook called the Fairfax Manuscript and many of the themes there are based on the passion of Christ. The words decisively determined a musical effect. One of those poems may be written by the monk, John Lydgate, who died around 1450, was set to music by Sheringham about 50 years later. And in that poem, very much in the spirit of the time's devotion, he calls on gentle Jesus. He observes the suffering of the cross and is told by Jesus to think on this lesson that now 
I teach thee. It is a lesson, he says, a place for the soul to learn from. And it speaks, he says, still. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. We stand to sing the hymn, Morning Glory, Starlit Sky.
Song for Holy Saturday by James K. Baxter. When his tears ran down like blood, I was sleeping in my clothes. When they struck him with a reed, I cracked a very clever joke. When they gave him a shirt of blood, I praised the color of her dress. All the way up the hill, we were laughing, fit to kill. When they were driving in the nails, I listened to the steel guitar. When they gave him gall to drink, we were sipping the same glass. When he cried aloud in pain, we were playing Judas's. When the ground began to shake, we pulled up the coverlet. Clean, confessed, and comforted, to the midnight mass I come. You who died in pain alone, break my heart, break my heart. Deus sine termino. And so we move finally with a big jump because of course I'd love to keep you here all day to explore the 17th century, the 19th century, but time is limited, so we've jumped into the 20th. A century that understood tragedy, loss, destruction and death from the Somme to Auschwitz, Hiroshima, to Rwanda. Amongst the death of so many, what is so important about the death of one outside Jerusalem 2,000 years ago? But it might be that it is exactly because there are so many that statistics cannot be imagined that the death of one brings home to the heart the death of all. And so many 20th century writers have still been drawn to the passion of Christ. The soldier poets of the First World War, for instance, such as Wilfred Owen, use the crucified to distill a sense of what they were doing in the trenches and who they were becoming there. Owen speaks of Christ being in no man's land on the cross. And here in his At a Calvary near the Anchor, he sees a crucifix in France placed significantly at a crossroads that has been damaged in cross fire. Cross fire. One ever hangs where shelled roads part. In this war, he too lost a limb, but his disciples hide apart, and now the soldiers bear with him. Near Golgotha strolls many a priest, and in their faces there is pride that they were flesh-marked by the beast by whom the gentle Christs denied. The scribes on all the people shove and brawl allegiance to the state, but they who love the greater love lay down their lives. They do not hate. Here Owen, like that soldier at the foot of the cross, is able to see the righteous Son of God when the chief priests of organized religion are busy blessing armies. He sees sense in the teachings of the man who is crucified, the man of sorrows who understands what Owen and his colleagues are undergoing. But Christ is here less adored than respected. But there is a mutuality a recognition of the greater power of love, even when put to death, 
of the greater integrity of the peace-loving, even when butchered, going over the top. Robert Graves, after the war, wrote that even when respect for organized religion died amongst the men, reverence for Jesus as our fellow sufferer remained. Others begin to wonder whether God is suffering too. In this war, he too, writes Owen, has lost a limb. Such a move towards believing that God suffers is also found in that hymn we just sang by W.H. Vanston, an Anglican priest who died about 13, 14 years ago. Therefore he who shows us God helpless hangs upon the tree and the nails and crown of thorns tell of what God's love must be. Here is God, no monarch he, throned in easy state to reign. Here is God, whose arms of love aching, spent, the world sustain. One of the reflections of the atonement that has drawn people in the 20th century is that of Christ the scapegoat. Knowing that human beings like to identify a common enemy, usually an outsider, to keep their group together, an embodiment of evil on which they can throw their violence, we're seeing quite a lot of it at the moment, we find Jesus asking his followers to break such cycles of retributive hatred and to learn to touch the untouchable. Instead of the one being castigated by the 99, he tells a story of leaving the 99 to find the one. And he dies as the unjustly persecuted scapegoat who willingly takes our violence on himself to break the circle and stop others being scapegoated on, praying even as he dies for forgiveness and not revenge. He absorbs hate without passing it on and bids his followers do the same so that the mechanisms of projected hate are broken. He dies as we must live. The poem we heard read was written by the New Zealand poet James K. Baxter, not half as well known here in the UK as he is in his home country. Baxter died in 1972, he was only 46. But in that relatively short life, he wrote over 600 pages of political, lyrical, and spiritual poems, born in an extraordinary life that saw him convert to Anglicanism, and then to Roman Catholicism, and then at the end living as a countercultural guru sometimes affected by alcoholism and drug use, his poetry is scarred with 20th century abuse. A life lived safely for him threatened his art. But his poems are often profoundly sensitive to the being of God, to the cry of the poor, to the needs of community. He hated what he called the modern world's depersonalization, centralization, and desacralization. And angry and offensive as many of his poems are, he said he could still find reason for hope in the hearts of people. Surrender, he writes in one of his poems, surrender to the sky your heart of anger. He once recalled how he wrote his first poem. I climbed up to a hole in a bank above the sea and there fell into the attitude 
of listening out of which poems may rise, not to the sound of the sea, but to the unheard sound of which poems are translations. The unheard sound of which poems are translations. In his song for Holy Saturday, with its stabbing couplets, we hear of the distractedness and indifference of 20th century folk to the events of Christ's passion. And seeing himself caught up in this indifference, he prays, you who died in pain alone, break my heart, break my heart. The crucifixion here is not provoking him to wonder whether God is absent, but whether he is. We are. Fooling around, trying to make our mark and enjoy life whilst absent from ourselves and from those unheard sounds that lie deep down. Baxter was always drawn to those soldiers who played dice at the foot of the cross Yes, that's what we'd be doing, he says. His word play draws this out. We crack jokes as the whip cracks. The steel nails are not heard because of the steel guitar. This is a Christ who is raised up but is not seen because we haven't yet seen ourselves. The poem ends speaking of God without end. If the cross and suffering of his Christ broke his heart, then life might begin to seep into him. Christ needing to rescue us from what he calls our civilized darkness. His soul needing to be shocked by the love and fidelity of Calvary. Wondering why he might not be able to be faithful and love like this man being tortured, he keeps asking deeper questions of who we've become and alerts us to the fact that we can't save ourselves. We can't heal ourselves. This has to come from outside from lovers, both human and divine. With all our advances, scientific, military capability, vaccinated against feeling by distraction and the global, we need saving from ourselves, he says. The poet W.H. Auden, another 20th century poet, in one of his poetic sequences, used the crucified Jesus as the fixed point of reference, the victim whom we, in our ordinary round of busy city lives, kill daily without letting ourselves acknowledge just what we've done between noon and three. A nice late afternoon siesta wipes out our memory of shouting with the crowd for his death. Waking refreshed, he writes, we have time to misrepresent, excuse, deny, mythify, use this event while under a hotel bed in prison, down wrong turnings, its meaning waits for our lives. The poems we have looked at today, between noon and three, all in their various diverse ways, have the cross as the fixed point and invite us to recognize that its meaning waits for our lives. God, at the end of prose, writes the Australian poet Les Murray, somehow be our poem. At the very end of this devotion, we will hear from the poet R.S. Thomas, who died in 2000. 
Seamus Heaney called him the Clint Eastwood of the spirit. And in the poem we will hear the musician, we hear a response to the cross. May God through your prayers this day and your life from now on find your response, bring you peace and at one with him so that we may live lives of gratitude, secure in the belief that God is in the world, is on the cross, is in your imperfect human heart, just as poetry is in the poem. I'm going to now offer at the end of this address short prayers which were written through the different generations, centuries that we've just looked at. So let us pray. A prayer of the ruler and poet King Alfred the Great from the ninth century. Lord God Almighty, I pray you for your great mercy and by the token of the holy rood, guide me to your will, to my soul's need, better than I can myself, and shield me against my foes, seen and unseen, and teach me to do your will, that I may love you inwardly before all things with a clean mind and a clean body, for you are my maker and redeemer my help, my comfort, my trust, and my hope. Praise and glory be to you now, Lord of the rude, ever and ever, and world without end. Amen. A prayer of Marjorie Kemp from the 15th century. Our dear God, I have not loved you for all my life, and now I bitterly regret the time when I ignored you. I ran away from you, yet you ran after me. So now, for all my impurity, you have given me hope, and I bless you. And finally, a prayer of Jim Cotter from the 20th century. God bless this city and move our hearts with pity lest we grow hard. God bless this place with silence, solitude and space that we may pray. God bless these days of rough and narrow ways, lest we despair. God bless the night and calm the people's fright that we may love. God bless this land and guide us with your hand, lest we be unjust. God bless this earth through pangs of death and birth and make us whole. Amen. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb, tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The Musician by R.S. Thomas. A memory of Chrysler once, at some recital in this same city, 
The seats all taken, I found myself pushed onto the stage with a few others, so near that I could see the toil of his face muscles, a pulse like a moth fluttering under the fine skin, and the indelible veins of his smooth brow. I could see, too, the twitching of the fingers, caught temporarily in art's neurosis, as we sat there, all warmly applauded. This player, who so beautifully suffered for each of us upon his instrument. So it must have been on Calvary, in the fiercer light of the thorns haloed, the men standing by and that one figure, the hands bleeding, the mind bruised but calm, making such music as lives still, and no one daring to interrupt because it was himself that he played. And closer than all of them, the God listened.
Let us pray. Almighty Father, look with mercy on this your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who is alive and glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, and that which had not been heard told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? for he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you made his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
reading from the letter to the Hebrews. This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord.
Behold the wood of the cross, on which was hung the Saviour of the world. Behold the wood of the cross on which was hung the Saviour of the world. Behold the wood of the cross on which was hung the Saviour of the world.
God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Therefore, we pray to our Heavenly Father for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Church of God throughout the world, for unity in faith, in witness and in service, for bishops and other ministers and those whom they serve, for Christopher, our bishop, Rosemary and Martin, our area bishops, and the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this place, for those to be baptised, for those who are mocked and persecuted for their faith, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, hear our prayer, which we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry they may serve you in holiness and truth, to the glory of your name, through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the nations of the world and their leaders, for Charles, our King, and the parliaments of this land, for those who administer the law and all who serve in public office, for all who strive for justice and reconciliation, that by God's help the world may live in peace and freedom. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear us. us. Most gracious God and Father, in whose will is our peace, turn our hearts and the hearts of all to yourself, that by the power of your Spirit, the peace which is founded on justice may be established throughout the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for God's ancient people, the Jews, the first to hear his word, for greater understanding between Christian and Jew and Muslim, for the removal of our blindness and bitterness of heart, that God will grant us grace to be faithful to his covenant and to grow in the love of his name. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear us. us. Lord God of Abraham, bless the children of your covenant, Jew, Christian and Muslim. Take from us all blindness and bitterness of heart and hasten the coming of your kingdom when the Gentiles shall be gathered in, all Jerusalem shall be saved and we shall dwell together in mutual love and peace under the one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe the gospel of Christ, for those who have not heard the message of salvation, for all who have lost faith, for the contemptuous and scornful, for those who are enemies of Christ and persecute those who follow him, for all who deny the faith of Christ crucified, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear us. Merciful God, creator of all the people of the earth, have compassion on all who do not know you, 
and by the preaching of your gospel with grace and power, gather them into the one fold of the one shepherd, Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all those who suffer, for those who are deprived and oppressed, for all who are sick, for those in darkness, in doubt and in despair, in loneliness and in fear, for prisoners, captives and refugees, for the victims of false accusations and violence, for all at the point of death and those who watch beside them, that God in his mercy will sustain them with the knowledge of his love. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously, graciously hear us. us. Almighty and everlasting God, the comfort of the sad, the strength of those who suffer, hear the prayers of your children who cry out of any trouble and to every distressed soul grant mercy, relief and refreshment. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us commend ourselves and all God's children to God's unfailing love and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have died in the peace of Christ we may come to the fullness of eternal life and the joy of the resurrection. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favourably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, and by the tranquil operation of your perpetual providence, carry out the work of our salvation. And let the whole world feel and see that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are returning to perfection through him from whom they took their origin, even Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
standing at the foot of the cross, as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed.
Let us pray. Merciful God, by, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.